morning, everybody. Um, are we good to go with filming and everything? Okay. Uh, I've been told that I must stand about right here. <laughs> this is going to be a big challenge for me. Come on in. Um, I tend to pace, so if I pace, it's got to be everybody's responsibility not only to make the best use of evidence, but to make sure that you tell me I'm pacing. Um, because I, then I won't, I just won't be on camera. Uh, actually, I may be on camera a bit, but you won't be able to hear me. It's okay. Scoot on by. Don't trip. <laughs> okay. Um, I thought while everybody was making their way down, uh, the, the elevators may be crowded. I'm not sure. Maybe we could uh, just kind of do a show of hands for folks. Um, how many people here know really well what a systematic review is and maybe have performed a systematic review? Well, that's a double barrel question, isn't it? Know what a systematic review is. All right. How many of you guys have actually done a systematic review? Okay. Um, well, you're in the right place, um, and uh, I ask that simply because uh, we haven't yet, uh, it's 10.45, the conference started at 9, and we haven't defined what they are yet. So I'll make an attempt at that uh, last second. Um, so uh, if the slides are a bit off, it's because I added them about 30 seconds ago. Um, and uh, come on in, no worries, we haven't really started yet. I'm stalling, this is what's known as stalling. Um, so where, where are you guys all from? Let's say uh, social welfare, is that your content area? Education, crime and justice, international development, engineering, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> anything else, did I miss anything? Health. Health, that would be a good one. That would be a big one to miss. Methods. Methods. The sole methods person in the room. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, any, anything else? Okay, so a good range of people here. This is great. All right, so we're going to talk about problem formulation. And um, I have begged, borrowed, stolen all sorts of slides from all sorts of people. And I'm hoping that I, I cited them all fairly well. Uh, and um, apologies if I didn't, particularly the last second slides. Um, in a way, this is the hardest part of systematic reviewing. So it's really important to kind of nail down how the problem is formulated, and I would argue to nail down a question. And I'm going to give a bit of background information uh, to spur us on a bit. So uh, evidence-based practice, evidence-informed practice, uh, requires a funny thing. It's called evidence, and it comes in a lot of different forms. Um, the best model that uh, I found uh, and was introduced to it actually by Eileen Gambrill here is uh, an evidence-based practice model from health that is based on evidence-based medicine uh, and, uh, that uh, uh, Haynes Devereaux and Guiat, Guiat, I still don't know how to pronounce his name, uh, uh, came up with it's based on the original Sackett model of evidence-based medicine and it combines current best evidence with clinical state and circumstances of the client uh, and client preferences and actions and that the intersection of those is what would be termed clinical expertise uh, and it's important to note that evidence is not the entire piece of the pie it is in fact uh, current best evidence is part of it, but we actually have to figure out what clients' preferences and values are, uh, where they're at, uh, and we can take this out to policy as well. We heard today about cooking and difficulties with, uh, you know, you may have uh, great evidence that cooking in a certain way is good, but there may be extenuating circumstances that you need to be aware of, and in fact, that's always the case. So if we look out to this kind of clinical interaction, um, it, it happens in, um, within a context. It doesn't happen in a, in, in a vacuum. 
So there are politics behind <coughs> everything. There's, there are organizational uh, uh, issues, who's delivering the services. There's a political context, why were those services put in place in the first place and how is that going. We all come from different disciplines. We have different training, uh, different types of supervision. So the professional context is, is in there as well. Uh, there are organizational resources and constraints and economic issues, which often dictates what services people might be getting. Uh, and then there are com community level factors and socio-historical factors. So uh, a good example perhaps might be uh, working with uh, Aboriginal clients in child welfare. And if you don't know the history of the residential schools movement, let's say in Canada, or uh, um, uh, the same kinds of things that happened here, frankly, uh, and in Australia, and in New Zealand, you may actually be missing the boat in terms of the types of services delivered. People may not show up in the first place because um, the history uh, uh, of working with Aboriginal people is um, uh, pretty bad, frankly. So. Uh, kind of thinking about all of these contexts and interactions, these, any of these intersections are places for a systematic review. And it's important for us to do systematic reviews, I think, and I'll get to that in a second. I don't want to leave you thinking that if you just combine evidence and clinical pref and client preferences and values and clinical state and circumstances, you are then doing evidence-based practice. In fact, there is a series of steps that involve systematically searching for evidence, locating that evidence, appraising that evidence, and figuring out how that evidence applies or doesn't apply to your particular client, and then uh, evaluating whether it was effective with that client. Uh, and I like Len Gibbs' addition to uh, this list, which is teaching others to follow uh, the same process. I got this from his 2003 book, which is um, a classic for, right at this point, I think, for social work. But um, so moving on, uh, there's another little chart uh, that I've seemed to found, seem to have found uh, uh, on the evidence-based behavioral practice website, and it talks about asking the question, uh, acquiring the data acquiring the evidence, appraising the evidence, applying the evidence, analyzing and adjusting. So the, the sense generally is that we f figure out what's out there and then try to contextualize it. Okay? So, and, and why is this important? I, I think we've gotten a bit away, hopefully, from just what works to what is most likely to work for whom, when, and delivered in what way. Um, and I think the use of the word likely was purposeful because what works is a pretty uh, you know, binary statement. What works? Well, what works all the time for everybody in this population? That, that's really not what we're talking about. We're talking about things like effect sizes. So for some people who get this particular intervention, uh, there may be uh, an effect, which means that uh, if it's a positive effect, the treatment group uh, actually did a bit better, and the size of the effect is how much better, than a group that didn't get that same treatment or got a different treatment. Uh, and that doesn't mean that the people who get that intervention, w if we say that it is, quote, effective, that they'll all get better all the time. Some people who get the treatment get better, some people who don't get the treatment get better. And that's kind of, that's the context. So now we're starting to get at problem formulation um, uh, a little bit more anyway, but I'm going to do a detour into what is a systematic review and why might we want to do it. Um, these are not necessarily the 10 agreed upon steps that everybody would say needs to be happen for a systematic review, but they are at least 10 steps. It's creating a question, verifying that the question hasn't already been asked. And this is part of our process at Campbell. So if you put in a uh, title uh, registration form, we will actually uh, check to see that it hasn't been done before, or if there's overlap, we'll check. 
Um, and, uh, but we actually would really like authors to do this themselves because it's quite a lot of work for us to go through uh, maybe less so the Campbell website but more so the Cochrane website where there are over 3,000 reviews in there uh, and trying to figure out whether something similar has already been done because one of our principles is don't duplicate effort, right? Then we're going to write, after you get the title proposal in for Campbell, we bring it through um, the editorial process. We have a managing editor and an editor. They'll take a look at it. They'll send it by the co-chairs, and we all kind of uh, say, okay, this looks good to at least proceed to the next level. The next level is writing a protocol. And the protocol specifies how you're going to go about this systematic review states the question explicitly, states the methods for searching, states the methods, me methods for appraising, statistically combining if that's going to happen, uh, and what have you. Uh, so it's a priori, ahead of time, before we do this thing. And that's, I think, a key component of a systematic review, is we're not going to kind of adjust as we go, usually, unless you have to. Um, but we are going to pre-specify where we're going to go. Um, so uh, identifying sources of information, so we actually run uh, the systematic reviews by a librarian, uh, at least one of whom is sitting here today, and I think I met one earlier today also. Uh, and then basically extract, collect, extract the data. We screen all of the research and, um, and then assess the quality of the study studies. If there are enough studies that are not too different from each other, and you can make the argument that you can combine them, then we can do a meta-analysis uh, and present the results in a specific format, at least at Campbell uh, and Cochrane as well. Uh, and hopefully there will be a summary, we call these a user summary of, of the uh, review so that people can actually understand uh, what it says and don't have, basically you don't have to divine it from a 200 page document, um, which you should read, but um, uh, user summaries are really uh, actually becoming more and more important. So terminology, um, a review, a regular review is an article that summarizes a number of different primary studies that may draw conclusions about effectiveness. A review may or may not be systematic. So how many of you guys have actually done literature reviews before? And how did you choose which articles to put in? This is the audience participation component <laughs> of our talk today. How did you decide what to put in there? If it's not a systematic review anyway. There were links that were correlated to the main table. They were correlated to the main table. I mean, so you looked for studies and you found them and then you talked about them. Mm -hmm. Okay. You looked at the relevant same connection. Right, so any relevant study. Mm -hmm. How many people, and I'm raising my hand, have written a literature review where you kind of saying, all right, I'm interested in this area and I'm gonna do a search. Okay, I find articles, and oh, that one's good. I'm gonna put that one in. Ooh, I like what they say. Hmm, that's really interesting. Don't like that. <laughs> I've, I've for sure done that, right? And what ends up happening is that you get a biased look at the literature, and there have been studies on this. Uh, Julia Littell, uh, our new co-chair, does a great job of talking about how um, traditional literature reviews are inherently biased. They are. Uh, people are choosing what uh, they find compelling, uh, and it's natural. It's the way we're built. Uh, so, um, uh, in fact, she does kind of a look at the biases that uh, are abound in a certain area uh, uh, in terms of the reviews of a particular program, uh, MST. Uh, and the reviews prior to her systematic review uh, were unequivocally positive and overstated um, uh, quite a lot of the evidence. And I'm not saying MST isn't a good program, uh, but uh, the reviews of the program, the literature reviews, uh, were you know, basically saying this is the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, and when a systematic review was done, actually it became a lot more complicated than that. Uh, a systematic review is a review of the evidence on a clearly formulated question, which is what we'll be largely covering today. 
uh, that uses systematic and explicit methods to identify, select, and critically appraise relevant primary research and to extract and analyze data from the studies that are included in the review, statistical methods uh, may or may not be used. So basically we're saying we are going to, to the best of our ability, and I think that's important, look at all of the literature and not play favorites in terms of, wow, I like this one, I like that one, but to explicitly and a priori ahead of time define what we're going to include and exclude. And we're going to do that for very good reasons and we're going to say what those reasons are. And the order of the day is transparency. So if I'm producing a systematic review, you ought to be able to find the same answer. What we don't want is for people to do systematic reviews that are done exactly the same way and come up with different answers. That's probably not good. So we have to be very explicit about what we do and how we do it. A systematic review may or may not contain a meta-analysis, which is a statistical combining of studies. And this makes it really difficult in some ways to do a systematic review. We've got statisticians who are uh, bickering about how to do different types of um, procedures in, in meta-analysis. Uh, but I think it's important to distinguish between a meta-analysis and a systematic review that contains a meta-analysis. So meta-analysis, in a sense, is like a primary study. Uh, and instead of individual subjects, you have individual studies. And the extent that you can be biased in terms of your primary study where uh, you select people uh, to be in the study and there are selection biases for who ends up being in your study. Same holds true for a regular meta-analysis. If I want to show that something works, for instance, I could pick all the studies that show that it works and lo and behold my meta-analysis will show that it works. So the systematic part of systematic reviews means that I'm looking for all the literature uh, in general, we encourage people to look beyond English literature. We absolutely require that you look at the gray literature, that is literature that's not published, because we know that there's a bias for P is less than 0.05, and if you don't find some positive thing, it's less likely to show up in the published literature. Does anybody know why um, 0.05 was chosen as the statistical cut point? I always love asking this question because there really isn't a good answer. Uh, somebody at some point, I think it was Ari Fisher, thought that that was a good idea. That's about the best answer. Um, so 0.05 is, is great, but it seems to dictate a whole lot of things. Uh, and in a meta-analysis that's contained within a systematic review, we will actually look at things other than 0.05, like effect size. Uh, you'll learn that in later sessions. We won't go into that, but I think it's really important. Uh, traditional reviews are basically convenient samples of published studies, that same kind of primary study uh, uh, or primary research uh, parallel. Um, it's generally narrative uh, description of studies um, and what uh, uh, Julia and others like to call cognitive algebra or vote counting to, systemat uh, systematic to synthesize, wow, that was difficult to say, results. <laughs> Um, and again, it relies on statistical significance, which may be, uh, A, underpowered to detect differences. So there may not be a, a enough power to detect differences if they actually do exist. Frankly, they can be overpowered too, right? Um, I'm working with big data frequently, and I'll have 10, 20,000 people in a study. 0.05 to me, yeah, okay, great. Actually tells me more about something when it doesn't, you know, it isn't statistically significant. Um, the decision rules about which studies to include and not include are not transparent at all. Um, so what I've noticed lately is that people are calling uh, traditional reviews systematic reviews because they use some sort of a systematic <coughs> process for finding the articles, but it's still not transparent enough. It cannot be called a true systematic review just because you state what your search criteria might have been. Uh, and as we discussed earlier, it, there are a lot of sources of bias. Uh, some 
interesting developments are that there are things called scoping or mapping reviews, and these generally map the literature without saying that something works or doesn't work. It's just getting a general sense of what the literature says. Uh, they can sometimes include gray literature. I would hope they would. There's no necessarily, there's no quality assessment required of the studies. Um, they can be really rigorous, they can be transparent, they can be really good for getting an overview of what the literature looks like. Um, they can change as you go because you discover different things, but in general you want to pre-specify how you're searching the, the problem, the, formulate the question, what you're going to search for, uh, and um, report on what you find. And they can be pretty dry because we're not trying to take it anywhere, really. We're just trying to do this overview so that people can get a sense of what's out there. The next step would be a systematic review. Uh, somewhere in between would be uh, what's called a rapid evidence assessment. And um, uh, to be honest with you, I'm mixed on, on these. Um, I think they're required a lot of times by government. We had a, an instance in Australia where we had a government require us to do everything on out-of-home care, otherwise unspecified, for six, in six weeks. Because they need to make decisions now. Now, you can turn those away. And maybe we should, because it can't be done, or at least it can't be done well. Uh, or you say, this can't be done well, here's what I'm going to focus on, uh, but really we should be pushing toward a systematic review of specific questions. Uh, what's nice about rapid evidence assessments is that they do use systematic processes in general. They are transparent. Uh, they look at the state of literature within time constraints. Um, and. Uh, it, you know, it uses some of uh, the um, tools that we'd find in systematic reviews. That said, though, um, we need to clearly state that it's not a systematic review, and that, in fact, if you do a systematic review, you might find something totally different at the end of the day. Um, there are also qualitative sy syntheses, um, and these are uh, systematic syntheses of qualitative studies. And I actually think that this is a good idea. Um, we ought to, like Howard was saying earlier, we ought to be systematic about uh, looking at the different types of research that might be out there so that we can be inclusive of everything that's been done. It's a bit more difficult with qualitative. It's less defined in terms of what to do. Um, we're not looking necessarily at efficacy or effectiveness, but we're maybe trying to understand the processes involved with particular interventions or different problems or what have you so that we can get a systematic look uh, at these things and then do something about them. Um, some people would say you should stratify by method. So if I'm doing, if I'm looking across methods, maybe I put all the phenomenological studies in one pile. I put all the grounded theory studies in another, and then I synthesize within those. Um, and it's generally to generate hypotheses, uh, or increasingly, which I think is really neat, it's being used to uh, um, look at the processes within randomized controlled trials, within uh, rigorous effectiveness type of studies, to really understand what's going on in there and what the experiences are of uh, both uh, the people who are receiving the intervention and people who are delivering it, because it turns out that's important too. Uh, and it may be important to reach, uh, for reaching uh, uh, hard to reach samples. Uh, so if we're looking at, uh, let's say, uh, homeless youth uh, who, who uh, may be hard to find, maybe sexual minority youth, whatever it is, um, uh, it's important to, to really look at uh, using different methods to get there. Okay, so that's ba those are basically the slides that I added 30 seconds ago. Yeah. Can I just quickly ask the stratification by methods? I'm still looking for a good example that actually does that because most of them don't. And yeah. I just wonder whether there's a valid argument to do so. Uh, I think there's a valid argument, but it may not be based on any evidence whatsoever. Just that the different methods are. Are, are different. Similar, I think the, val the argument stems more from when we look at, um, uh, you know, effectiveness studies. Let's say we're looking at RCTs, random controlled trials, versus uh, other less rigorous designs. 
we generally look at things differently and make sure that, that the differences we see uh, aren't due to design. So I think, you know, there may not be too many examples, and it's much more theoretical at this point, but if the designs are actually quite a bit different and different kinds of information are coming out of them, uh, we may have different answers, and who's to say which one's better, worse, what have you, and should you just slop them all together? The answer always with systematic reviews, I find, is stratify, look at it differently, take it apart. And then if you can make a good rationale for bringing them together based on the actual content that you're looking at, then do so. But be careful. So I'm punting on that one. And this is not about that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm to I'm gonna try not to get lost in that quagmire today, anyway. But happy to talk about it other times. So all right, um, problem formulation and questions. So in general, uh, this is about asking questions, asking questions in a way that can be answered by a systematic review. Uh, and I like cartoons. I think it breaks stuff up. So there are a lot of <coughs> cartoons today. Uh, so hopefully you'll be enjoying them. To be or not to be, that is a question. Next question. <laughs> uh, and it turns out that there are next questions. There are lots of questions. So. Uh, if we look at the types of questions that might a uh, be asked within a systematic review, we often hear about effectiveness or prevention. So is one thing better at another for treating something or from uh, stopping something from occurring? But it's not the only type of question. So there can be risk or prognostic questions. So what might happen? What might happen if we do something or do nothing? And this is generally looks at instruments, so tools or rules for uh, use for prediction. There's also, are there assessment questions? So you might ask the question, you know, how do I know whether someone is depressed or anxious? What tools are there out there? And we can do a systematic review on the types of tools that measure these constructs. There are also description questions, and this is basically um, uh, one of the areas that's, um, that needs to be developed more. So there are observational studies that we can do systematic reviews on. Um, so we're looking at the dynamics of a given population. Uh, and I actually failed to put a site on this, but this is cited from, this is a lot of sources, from Sackett, from Gibbs. Um, but it can also be about satisfaction with services. It can be process oriented. It can be qualitative. We lump them all into this particular description category, but they could be um, compartmentalized so we have 10 different types of questions. Uh, in any case, I think the most important message, and um, Howard gave it earlier, is that different types of information are important. Different types of questions are required to get to different types of answers. And in, in fact, I think I would look at evidence as a mosaic of different types of evidence driven by different types of questions. I hope that makes sense. In the immediate term, there are what Sackett was, would in 2000 called background and foreground questions. So a background question would be, what do I generally, what's the general stuff I need to know about this particular problem? Maybe it's diabetes. Maybe it's, uh, you know, teen behavior around adhering to protocols for treating diabetes. Maybe it's whatever it is. But I need to know kind of background about <coughs> this particular problem I'm dealing with. That's different than a foreground question. A foreground question is going to be very specific, and it's going to be about um, specific knowledge about helping a person, or in our case today, about an intervention uh, that covers a few basics. And we're going to get we're going to drill down into this uh, quite a lot. Uh, so the client specifics about uh, who they are, about the type of intervention, about any kind of comparison condition and about outcomes. Um, and 
again, I think it's important to understand that we're doing these systematic reviews for a reason, and I'm, I'm staying kind of within the EBP literature. We're going to kind of move away from that a little bit, but we're still going to stick in that because we're not doing systematic reviews so we can get the next publication. Let's face it, these things take too long uh, to just uh, build your uh, academic career on systematic reviews. Uh, I think you can, but the purpose really is because they're helpful, because we have too much information, because we want to decrease the amount of bias uh, uh, in, in the literature uh, and find out, if we can, uh, what's really going on. Uh, and it may be that we don't know, and that's actually an answer as well. So getting into conceptual and operational definitions, I think, is, is important. And uh, I do want to point out that um, Jeff Valentine has given this particular lecture before, and I like popping up his face there because I completely stole this from him uh, and have done so several times and am happy to continue doing so because he's, he's great. Uh, he does a lot of really uh, good work for, for Campbell. So um, operational definitions in terms of what are we looking at, it really needs to uh, uh, fit the concept or concepts. And this is sometimes not clear from the literature at all. What are we looking at? What is the problem? In social science is riddled with um, different conceptualizations that really uh, almost have no basis in reality. Um, and it's sometimes very difficult to divine that. And sometimes the language within articles is something other than understandable, I'll put it that way. Um, and different fields can use different kinds of terminology. Uh, you know, I used to look at a lot of sociological literature and sometimes it feels like they're writing in a different language. And really trying to understand that is, is, is something different altogether. Um, but basically, uh, we need to make sure that we're referring to the same things that everybody else is referring to. And if there is, are differences in the literature, then we need to talk about what those are in a systematic review and prior to that, formulating the problem. So an example, this may seem up in the air, so I'll bring it down. Family group conferencing. Does anybody know what family group conferencing is? Yeah, okay. So it turns out there are different forms of family group conferencing. So there's a family unity model. There's a family group conferencing model. There's the um, Casey family model. There's all, there's all sorts of stuff. They're all kind of called family group conferences. Are they the same thing? Well, sort of. Some of them require that the family, this is so family group, mo, family group conferencing is uh, as used in child protection, it's also used in, in uh, justice, but as, uh, in child protection basically we're talking about bringing the family together uh, usually at a uh, beginning point in a child protection case and asking them to come together, bring everybody that's involved in the family uh, and or who's important in your life, come together and come up with a plan for this particular problem that has been identified. Some of the family group conferencing models uh, will require that the family meet alone without a social worker present. Some will require a social worker to be present. Some will require your mediator to be present. Some will say, well, we don't, you know, there may be differences, I guess is what I'm saying. Is it the same intervention? And the answer is we don't necessarily know because we haven't tested it. So um, we end up writing a protocol that says we're going to look at these things separately. We're going to see, well, maybe what is the effect of this particular thing. But the point is, is that we're aware going in that these differences exist. Um, be careful about relying on the labels provided in the studies. They'll all call themselves family group conferencing. And they may take one particular form or another, but unless you know what those, what is, in, what in, is entailed in that intervention and um, you kind of try to disentangle it, you really don't know that what it is. They could call themselves family group conferencing and actually be nothing of the sort. 
in which case I might reject that article out of hand because it's not delivering the intervention it says it's delivering. Um, systematic reviews are often subject to the critique of apples and oranges, that when we start combining studies that we're losing the context in which those studies were conducted and we can't, we're combining things that are different. Uh, and uh, as Jeff says, this parallels the same thing in primary studies where we're looking at an average effect. And in a sense, that's what we're doing. We are looking at an average effect, but um, you can't combine completely different concepts. And it's important as we go forward to um, make sure that we're not doing that. All right, so getting to specifics. Um, this is just fun. So this is, uh, this is the Campbell train. It's about to leave <laughs> the station and it's at the Pico stop. Pico happens to be a street in Los Angeles where I grew up. I didn't grow up on Pico Street, but I, I did go to school uh, very near Pico. And uh, there's even a song called Pico and Sepulveda, which has been remade and I used to listen to as a child with Dr. Demento. Anybody remember Dr. Demento? Yeah, Pico and Sepulveda. It's actually a place. Uh, so before we leave the station on our systematic review, um, it's a good idea to have a strategy for a type of question. And in general, um, the uh, Picos, uh, it started as Pico, um, uh, has been invented to formulate fairly clear questions uh, generally started with effectiveness, but it's been translated into other types of questions as well. Um, and there's some variability here. Different people call P different things, so we're just going to be uh, very inclusive. Uh, P, population, participants, the problem. What is it? The intervention. What is it? The comparison group. Uh, and outcomes, and then there's been a re fairly recent addition, uh, and that is the study designs. Um, so for the population or the patients, which patients or population or clients are we interested in? How can they best be described? Are there subgroups that need to be considered? Anything like that. Uh, for the intervention, which one? What type of treatment? What type of approach? For the comparison, uh, what is a comparison? What are the main alternatives? What are clients using? And we should be always cognizant that, you know, the literature may not reflect actually what's important to clients. So um, people would argue, and I think they have a good point, that uh, clients, the actual end users of these interventions, <laughs> ought to be involved in some way in the development of systematic review questions. Otherwise, they might miss the mark entirely. Um, so, in terms of the outcome, what is important to patient, to clients? Um, what outcomes? Um, what outcomes are we thinking about? Are we t talking about uh, proximal or distal outcomes, short term, intermediate, long term, uh, and then study designs? Uh, what types of study designs are we interested in? What type of question is it? We might ask first. So, if it's an effectiveness question, am I going to look for randomized control trials? Uh, or am I going to expand into other areas? And it may be that um, we're more inclusive uh, because there isn't a lot of literature or there may be good reasons to expand past randomized control trials. Or it could be that there are a lot of randomized control trials in a given area and that we want to focus uh, on those um, for good reason. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. So. Um, Types of participants, um, uh, so this person is, is in some sort of uh, psychodynamic therapy, it looks like, uh, or, or psychoanalytic therapy, sorry. Oh, there's no question that you're obsessive compulsive. The question is whether you're obsessive compulsive enough. So who are the people that we are interested in? Uh, and it's diff in social interventions, it's a bit, it's a bit complex. Um, and we want to look at things like how the problem or condition is defined. And this is from the Cochrane Handbook, which is an amazing resource, really good stuff. Uh, and I will dip into that quite a bit. Um, what are the most important characteristics that define the population? 
Um, what relevant demographic characteristics might you be interested in? Uh, and I think all these questions need to actually be asked. Now, it could be that we go really broad and we just include everybody, but it could also be that we're more interested in these fine-grained details. And in fact, we should be interested in them uh, from the get-go. Um, it should spur us on to how we look at a given uh, problem or uh, population or what have you. Um, are there people who you would exclude from your systematic review? So can anybody figure out, if, can, do we have like any examples, let's say, of a problem area where you'd want to be very specific about the type of population that you are looking for in your review? It's okay, you can raise your hand. You won't be wrong. Yes. Yeah, the, the Regea review. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, sorry. The Regea review? Yeah, yeah. Right. So w women who have experienced rape. So um, is th in when we say women, do we mean women of all ages? Or do we mean women who were raped as children and they're now adults? Or do we call that sexual abuse? So we have to think about, okay, so what is the definition of this population? Because the treatment might be different. I'm not going to treat a four-year-old in the same way I would treat a 40-year-old, for instance. Um, and that's rather dramatic, of course, but um, so what else? So in that particular review, what would we think about? Um, well, we're A, we're specifying women. We're specifying rape. So that implies perhaps something different than, uh, you know, do we, <laughs> this is getting into uh, areas where the, guy up at the podium is going to, you know, not want to say anything, but um, <laughs> so we're talking about, you know, what are we talking about the severity, are we, are we talking about penetration, are we talking about, are we including cases of incest, are we, what are we including there? So it might seem really simple to say, okay, women who have been raped, we're going to do a systematic review on the treatment effectiveness of uh, interventions for women who have been raped, but we can't just apply that as a blanket statement. We have to think about what are the different strata that we might be interested in looking at. And are we talking about any kind of intervention? Are we including drugs? Wow, well, I didn't think of that. Okay. Uh, are we including all types of behavioral interventions or are we looking at specific behavioral interventions? So this is getting more into the, the uh, intervention, not the population. Um, and uh, we'll go right there. <laughs> Sorry, no water. We're just a support group. <laughs> uh, and so are we looking for support groups? Or are we looking for something to change cognition around the event? Are we looking for some sort of treatment around trauma? What are we doing? Um, so uh, what actually is being done out there. And this is kind of, in some ways, this is where a scoping review might be helpful uh, to know the range of interventions that are out there for a given problem, for a given population. Before doing a systematic review, it might actually help us come up with some of these questions. Um, are all the actual interventions the same? So it's like family group conferencing, there may be differences between even behavioral interventions. Can I just say behavioral interventions? Or are there perhaps different behavioral interventions, different classes? Do I want to look at all of them? Or do I want to focus on a specific one that's being used in my particular region? And then what am I comparing it to? Am I comparing it to nothing? So generally when people come in for treatment, they don't get nothing. They may get put on a wait list, in which case it could be randomized to the wait list, which might be good, uh, and in good in terms of actually uh, doing a study, not necessarily good for the person who's on the wait list, I might add. Uh, on the other hand, if we don't know if the treatment is effective, they might actually benefit from being on the wait list. Um, so, uh, or are we doing a comparative effectiveness research, which is kind of the new trend for sure, uh, and needs to be done. Uh, so one thing compared to another, and treatment as usual can actually be quite good in some instances. 
So we can't just say treatment as usual and just ignore what that is. We have to know what these things are. Mm. What if there are other interventions that they get at the same time? Do we include those? Do we document what that is? Can we stratify by that if it occurs often enough in our systematic review? Do we want to actually look at that? Uh, and types of outcomes. Um, I thought this was a funny outcome. It lo almost looks like a church sign, doesn't it? <laughs> Something like that. Um, so types of outcomes. Um, what are the essential features that are necessary for decision making? Again, let's, let's not just look at, you know, when we do studies oftentimes, it's like, oh yeah, let's look at depression, let's look at anxiety, let's look at whether they have a white dog, Let's look at anything, you know, what kind of shoes do they wear? Uh, you know, I mean, there's, there, there's a tendency to kind of um, run, uh, you know, three-hour interviews with a wide range of instruments. Some of them are um, apparently, you know, really important. Some of them, maybe not so much. Um, and I think it's important to, again, go back down to the client level. What is actually important for clients who have the particular problem within the given population that you've identified? So again, it comes back to consumers, users, clients, patients. What's important to them? In general, the Cochrane Handbook, uh, and this is probably a pretty good idea, talks about uh, uh, splitting between primary and secondary outcomes, and that really you want two or three primary outcomes that you're focused on. Because all of that level of detail that I went through just in these last few slides is nothing in comparison to what you will go through when you look at studies. They go all sorts of different directions and some of them are really, really crucial. So how do we kind of distinguish? How do we get between, you know, how do we focus on what's important? Um, so primary outcomes, two or three, there have been more, but two or three. Uh, and what really defines the primary from the secondary is what conclusions do you really want to reach? What are the most overriding concerns for this given population with this given intervention? Uh, secondary outcomes are crucial as well, and um, they would be comprised of the remaining outcomes but uh, also for uh, distinguishing between differences in uh, uh, all the other outcomes. So for moderator analysis. So, you know, if we're looking at, um, let's say, depression, we might also have some sort of a measure of what's your current living situation. Well, that might actually have a lot to do with whether you're depressed or not. Or, uh, you know, maybe um, you've had uh, a baby recently or something like that, some moderating effect. And these are really important to kind of to gauge as well. Uh, one really important thing is all interventions are not good. We heard today about uh, interventions that actually uh, weren't, like uh, scared straight, for instance. So thinking about adverse effect is important at the get-go. What might this intervention do that might actually harm people? And the review that Eileen brought up, the, the rape trauma review may have, uh, its findings may have implications in terms of the types of interventions that were found to be effective may actually be really difficult to live with for clients. So uh, thinking about adverse effect is crucial. We don't always do it. We haven't had a tradition of doing it in Campbell necessarily. We've looked at whether the overall intervention uh, is effective or not, but I think looking at adverse effects, especially across uh, secondary uh, outcomes, is probably really important. Um, and the timing, uh, type and timing of outcome measurements is really crucial as well. So in those waitlist control studies, uh, we have a fairly limited amount of time for follow-up in the control group. Uh, so maybe it's an eight-week program, we have outcomes eight weeks out, the wait list then gets the intervention and our measurement of these two groups uh, over time is, is one group getting it versus another group that's not getting it stops at that point. 
and you can look out further, and there might be good reason to look out further, but we really don't know what would have happened had that control group not gotten that intervention at that particular, at the end of the, uh, at, once they got off the wait list. Types of studies. So sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's not. Um, this is a joke article from the British, uh, from uh, BMJ, British uh, Medical Journal. And it's about the nest, it's uh, about doing a um, randomized control trial for the use of parachutes when jumping out of a plane. I don't think we need that study. Um, and there are a lot of studies out there that we don't need. Uh, this would be one. The point is, it's not always about an RCT. And you have to figure out, there is no, I don't think there's any rule, hard, fast rule. Uh, sometimes we should be limited to randomized control trials depending on the question. Sometimes it needs to, be, to move beyond that. I, you're taking a picture. You can take a picture if you want. You got it. Okay. So um, factors to consider when developing criteria for types of studies according to the, to the Cochrane Handbook. Um, what is, what type of question is it? Because that might dictate the type of studies you're going to get in there. So if it's effectiveness, prevention, or diagnostic, well, actually RCTs are pretty good for that. Uh, are there a lot of RCTs out there? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's important to get other information in there and to, maybe to equivocate a bit about our findings and say, well, there, we need to do more RCTs. Here's what these studies say. They're biased in this way. Use caution, but here's what it is. And I'm not recommending or not recommending. Boom, right? Uh, prognostic studies would use a cohort, would basically use cohort designs. Um, descriptive studies, process studies, all that, if you're doing a systematic synthesis of qualitative research, let's say. RCTs, why? We're actually getting at processes and not at effectiveness. Um, what is a known state of the field? So here's where I would recommend uh, scoping or mapping if it's, it's a fairly um, if, if this isn't known already. Um, and where, uh, where is your red line? Now this, the red line, that's not part of the Cochrane Handbook. Uh, and this is just my kind of take on it. So given the content area, the type of question being asked, and the type of intervention being delivered, do you stop with RCTs? Do you move to quasi-experimental designs? Are you going to be really, really rigorous? When I say randomized control trial, do I mean that the treatment and that people came into the study and they were randomly allocated to treatment and control? Or can I go quasi where maybe alternate day assignment? All right? So on Mondays they go to treatment, on Tuesdays they go to control. Less rigorous. Chance for bias. What if certain things happen on Mondays that don't happen on Tuesdays? What if a certain practitioner is there on Mondays, they're not there on Tuesdays? What if that practitioner is really good or really bad for that matter, right? Uh, or uh, some other sort of um, systematic uh, but not random assignment to groups. Am I going to look at people that are assigned to a wait list or not? Uh, am I going to go to other designs? One of the big areas is uh, uh, using statistical methods to create equivalent control groups like propensity score matching, difference of difference methods, looking for inter instrumental variables. Well, all of these are really good and they're really at the cutting edge of research and the era of big data is upon us and we ought to take advantage of that. But you have to decide whether you're going to include those types of studies and if you are, uh, a strong suggestion is to stratify by those different types of study designs because we don't know whether the differences between finding it w of findings is due to the actual intervention or due to the study design and I think that's crucial. Uh, what if I really am interested in long-term follow-up? Well, a lot of RCTs don't have that. So I might be interested in 
cohort studies of a different type. And the main thing is to be transparent about it, to give good reasons for those choices, and to go with it. Um, okay, so again, I'm gonna make a, an appeal to base these decisions on what clients uh, might experience. Um, and uh, that's basically all I'm saying here is, um, you know, client, uh, clients should be a part of this whole process. Uh, this is from NICE in um, the UK, uh, and basically they've embedded client uh, or patient, I renamed it uh, from patient to client, um, they've embedded clients into the general, their client needs, client um, experience, everything uh, into the generation of systematic review questions and that's really it's not a bad idea it's a really good thing to do but it makes it more complicated and it takes perhaps longer and maybe they might go in a direction you don't want to go in and those are the struggles you'll have okay we'll have question time very soon um, but in the meantime uh, sure, we can spend all day nitpicking specifics, but aren't sweeping generalities so much more satisfying? And uh, the answer is sometimes, it turns out, I think. So um, if we kind of think about questions and where we end up compromising, um, it's not all that clear where the line should be unless you start looking at content and the content should drive so each review is going to be different so we have very broad review questions and we have fairly specific review questions a specific review question might um, involve um, oh I've got these reversed this should be here look at that <laughs> wow that is really a bad bad figure <laughs> pretend this is up here and this <laughs> is down here um, and and we'll go from there okay uh, sorry about that so uh, in terms of relevance we might look at a uh, you know if we're being really specific we might look at a name brand program or practice and that should be down here again or if we're going broad we don't really know which program we want to evaluate but we want to evaluate generally all the interventions that purport to address this particular problem then we might want to be up here and in general and this is you know not a rule the broader the question the more studies are out there uh, and the more difficult it is in a sense to do a really good job uh, and we'll get into why that might be on the other hand specific programs may not be evaluated all that often and despite what uh, certain uh, government groups uh, otherwise unnamed might say two RCTs and a aspirin do not necessarily make an effective program um, and we really need to be careful about kind of um, uh, what we say uh, when we do these reviews. So um, basically when we move down into specifics, we're getting at really kind of is um, prolonged exposure uh, effective for treating X? Is um, Joe's uh, parenting intervention effective for decreasing Y. Very, very specific. Or we can move on up into a more broad question like um, do parenting programs in general uh, decrease child behavior problems? What parenting programs, right? And how do you get through that? So here's some examples. Um, and, and again, pulled from the Cochrane Handbook, and then we'll go over some uh, Campbell-specific ones. Um, and I'm having a really hard time reading this, but uh, but it's basically a steroid injection for uh, uh, shoulder tendons 
um, blah, blah, blah. So a broad scope, the advantage of a broad scope was you get a comprehensive overview of the use of this particular uh, injection, right? Uh, the disadvantage is that it, it may be more appropriate to, to prepare um, uh, uh, an overview of reviews, let's say. Uh, and there may already be systematic reviews that are very specifically uh, linked to specific types of steroids or what have you. Uh, and then in terms of a narrowing of the scope, we might narrow the <laughs> scope to the point where it becomes easier to do. So it's a particular type of steroid administered in a particular way, and we're looking at what the effect is on a particular outcome. All right? And the disadvantage is I might be a clinician looking for the use of a steroid administered in a different way and your review just doesn't apply. Or I might make the mistake of assuming that it does, and it really doesn't. Uh, so in terms of the, def of the intervention, uh, supervised running for depression or any exercise for depression. So the supervised running would be the narrow scope and any exercise for depression would be the broad scope. And it's, comp you know, for the broad scope, the advantages is comprehensive, uh, you can assess generalizability of findings across different studies, what have you, different implementations of the same thing. Um, and um, because it's broad, it requires more resources for searching and vetting and extracting. And anybody who's done data extraction on, you know, a hundred studies knows that that is not, it's no small thing. So it really does depend on your resources. Um, and in terms of uh, the um, narrow scope, it's much more manageable, again, because there are going to be fewer studies. Uh, the studies are going to be done much more similarly, et cetera. But again, the evidence may be sparse. We may not have all that many rigorous studies on supervised running, for instance. Um, and um, in terms of the choice of interventions and comparisons, uh, alarms for preventing bedwetting, which would be narrow, or interventions for preventing bedwetting. So is it alarms or is it uh, actual any intervention at all? And you, you know, are you going to combine alarms with a behavioral, other kind of behavioral intervention, let's say, or uh, alarms with uh, co-sleeping or something like that, I don't know, whatever. Um, and the answer is, well, maybe, maybe you wouldn't want to do that. Um, but, you know, you have these different considerations to make. In any case, uh, you need to think about more than one thing. Uh, after closer investigation, it's become clear that we need to enter more than one value. Uh, and value is important here. So what are the values that we're trying to do? What are our resources? What are, what are the values that we are uh, uh, that are at play here for us, for clients, and what are we trying to do. Um, so I'm going to go into uh, an example of mindfulness. And um, there are now, there is a review in the Campbell Library on mindfulness, uh, and that's mindfulness-based stress reduction for improving health, quality of life, and social functioning in adults. And then there's mindfulness-based parenting programs for improving psychosocial outcomes in children from birth to age 18. So let's, we're, we're starting to roll toward lunch. Let's break these down. Let me describe what these, actually let's have you describe the differences between these two titles in terms of broad or narrow scope and the intervention the PICO involved here, the population, the intervention, the comparison, and the outcome. Let's tear these apart. So I've done a lot of talking. So what do we, if we're gonna synthesize this in some way, we're talking about mindfulness. What is that? Is that It, yeah, so I'm going to repeat that for the folks here and at home. So uh, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, sounds like a specific program. 
very narrow scope. Whereas mindfulness-based parenting programs sounds like it might be, well, a pro parenting program not otherwise specified that includes some sort of mindfulness component. And somebody else kind of brought up mindfulness. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, everything from yoga to meditating for two hours straight. You know, uh, what is mindfulness? And this is, you know, you might find interventions that say mindfulness-based X, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's mindfulness, whatever that is. So in the review, we have to define what that is. And we define what that is generally by looking at the different types of interventions and saying, where do I draw the line? Can I give you a formula for doing that? Nope, I can't. You know, this isn't, an, this isn't something that a computer can do. I mean, we have to make judgments all the time with reviews. So uh, MBSR indeed is a specific program that uh, was developed in Massachusetts and has been implemented across a wide range of uh, different problems, uh, and it's theoretically uh, to uh, reduce stress, but it's also been linked to a whole lot of other types of outcomes as well. So now we're in a position where we have a very constricted program, MBSR. People get licensed to do this. They go through training, and they deliver this program that has a set number of sessions, and you do certain things in these sessions and you have training manuals and all of that and at the end of the day uh, you can deliver this to uh oh a really wide range of people <coughs> people who have back problems people who are depressed people who are stressed people who um people who have a parenting program i don't know you know uh but in to improve health quality of life and social functioning, I'll make it a little narrower, in adults. I mean, what's missing there? Is it to reduce crime? Well, that's kind of not there. But, you know, it's pretty broad. So now we're talking about a huge number of studies, perhaps, if this has been used all the time. And indeed it is. Uh, this review came out when? A couple of years ago, and it's probably already due for an update. Uh, and it turns out that mindfulness-based stress reduction has a moderate effect size across a range of uh, uh, outcomes for, that are linked to improving health, quality of life, and social functioning in adults, not kids. What is mindfulness? It's defined as getting MBSR. And if you look into MBSR, uh, it might be um, paying attention in a purposeful way uh, uh, to life or what have you. And they give you tools to do that. And there's a whole kind of theory behind it. Uh, and that's great. So mindfulness-based parenting programs for improving psychosocial outcomes in children from birth to age 18. Let's talk about that one. Broad, narrow. Where is it broad and narrow? It's more narrow in the age group. Okay, so the age of who? The child. That's the, point. The, the thing that stands out to me is the top one is something that a person is doing for themselves. The bottom one is something that someone's doing to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. So what if I have a teen mother? Very different in terms of the parenting. <laughs> you bet, you bet. Uh, so this is kind of, it's not in the title, it's not specified, but in the protocol, obviously it would be. But, uh, so we're talking about adults here, though, because the intervention is delivered to adults. It's a parenting intervention. Now, kids could be there. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But this is trying to get at outcomes for children through an intervention aimed at parents, targeted at parents. 
Uh, okay, so we have parents. Well, that's not all adults, but it's a huge proportion of them, right? Um, uh, psychosocial outcomes. What are those? That's huge. That's massive. I mean, how do you start? What's your primary outcome there? Okay, mm, well, there are a few. And what about uh, women who are pregnant? Well, I'm excluding those because it's birth to age 18, but you know, what if it goes over both areas? What if we start during pregnancy and we end six months after the baby's born? Do we include that study? These are the things that we have to think about all the time. Uh, and um, what is mindfulness-based parenting? Well, the answer is I don't really know. <laughs> and I'm on this review. So um, we're defining it in a certain way, and, but not all that clearly. And we're constricting in another way. We're saying because there is, and you may or may not agree with it, we're saying because there is so much out there that is being called mindfulness that is questionably mindfulness, uh, we're just going to look at RCTs. And we're going to cut away all of the other stuff out there that isn't being rigorously, um, isn't being rigorously studied. Is that kosher? Uh, well, you know, it got through methods. Is it a good idea? Um, I don't know. But I didn't see another way to do it because, you know, do a Google search of mindfulness parenting. <laughs> oh my gosh, there is a lot out there and we don't know what it is. And to sift through it is insane. Uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe we're not ready for a systematic review. Maybe we need to focus on a particular program. Uh, but these are the compromises that we make and we made that one. So, yeah. That's the idea in this review, and that may be a really bad idea to do as a general rule. That's, that, that was one of our main considerations, is we really don't know what this thing is. Uh, we really want to get into the literature because we think it's being used willy-nilly out there, and we don't know uh, whether or not that's a good idea, and we want to see uh, whether there has been any uh, rigorous research out there, and if so, what is it telling us? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we'll start stratifying. It's always stratifying. Uh, yeah? Let's say in the literature you find a definition for, or you find different definitions for mindful, mindfulness based parenting. And we will. Yeah, how do you approach that? Do you agree to use to define, um, to narrow your definition to one of those possible definitions? Or how do you go about that? Well, in, in essence, we've We've said um, that um, we're saying we, we've defined mindfulness as minimally involving an explicit focus on present focused attention and non judgmental acceptance. These are the two main frames. But I can deconstruct that in a heartbeat. All right? I mean, you know, uh, there's no. Um, you know, you ask the Dalai Lama what's mindfulness, you're going to get a different answer than John Kabat-Zinn, maybe. I don't know. Uh, so we are just explicitly looking at rigorously evaluated studies in the hopes of finding some way of defining mindfulness as it, and uh, some, some way of having it be integrated into a parenting program uh, and have an effect. And we just don't know, you know, where, when do you cross the line into 
well, is that just basic parenting and you're, you know, you're minding your kids. Is that mindfulness? Ah, I don't know. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. But in any case, it's a good illustration of broad and specific and defining your terms and trying to figure out what's out there. And some of these things are really squishy, which makes it really a lot easier to evaluate very, you know, uh, training manual manualized interventions um, are a lot easier to evaluate with a systematic review I think than broad programs uh, and it's just it's just very difficult it's not it's not easy to do you should do we should do it but it, it you know you pay a price yeah I have a question about the you have a whole range of outcomes like children who are say to four-year-old and it's very different from seven year or 12 years. So how, then you have a huge data set. Do you have some outcomes already in mind or? Um, you mean beyond psychosocial outcomes? Yeah, maybe. Uh, oh, whoops, I'm on the wrong one. So primary outcomes, unspecified by age, because we don't think we're going to find all that much uh, uh, we, 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 we really don't know what we're going to find out there. Um, child emotional and behavioral adjustment would be the primary. But what is that? Yeah. And, and doesn't that change as you move across that age bracket? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. It I'm, does. And parenting. It's defined single parenting, both parents. Yep. Or unrelated caregivers, for that matter. We're defining it as anybody who's raising the child at what time, at what age. So the thing is, is we're going to get a bunch of studies. And we're going to be able to say some things and not others. And if we get a range of age groups, then we can stratify by age group. You know, and when was the program delivered to whom? Uh, you know, there may be different demographic features. There may be different geographic features. There may be all sorts of things. And the point is, is you never know the answer. But we have to pre-specify the question as best we can. And then when we get these results, we start combining, we start synthesizing and meta-analyzing where possible. So um, some things are possible to look at, other things are not. But, but isn't that part of the value of doing this, is, is being able to say that if we looked at all these randomized controlled trials, the, the way it's defined is not universally accepted. So how can we begin to say there's a causal effect link between things with randomized controlled trials? If we're saying that the, the outcome measures are different at different ages, you're going to possibly see effect at this age around these things, but not at this age around these things. And that, to me, is, is part of the purpose, is to discover not only what's known, but the unknown. I could not agree with you more. If we find, for instance, no RCTs of mindfulness-based parenting interventions and your local YMCA is offering it up, I think that's really important to know, right? You're going to go to something that's untested and meanwhile we have a really good body of evidence of parenting programs for certain problems that we can tap into and you might make a different choice. Uh, and, and it would hopefully spur uh, uh, research, more rigorous research, into different mindfulness approaches, different integrative approaches, and what have you. So um, I think it's crucial to know um, whether something has been tested or not. Um, yeah, totally agree. Uh, yeah? If people want to try things before they study them as well, so th that's just a word on the other but this brought up a, a question that um, I had had a discussion with someone about whether you can combine, say, observational studies and RCTs in the same systematic review. And I was trying to think of an example, and I'm kind of wondering if I'm, I'm not actually looking at one. Um, is that done? Have you ever seen that done? Uh, you, you, okay, yes, you can have different study designs, but observational studies, as in cross-sectional studies, a uh, single point in time for an effectiveness question is probably not a good idea. I mean, methodologically speaking, what do you know? You don't have a cause and effect. You just don't have it there. 
So we, in general, and this will be in later sessions, do not combine different study types. We separately analyze them. So if you had maybe some, uh, we, my red line in general tends to be that we have some sort of comparison condition where you have baseline equivalents and they're contemporaneous. So in other words, they're not, uh, it's not a time series type design. Now I'm not doing an econometric study, and I'm not looking at an, an economic study. An economic study might well utilize time study, right? But for an effectiveness question, straight out treatment effect, I'm gonna want, personally, I'm gonna wanna look at uh, studies that move across time, uh, you know, different treatment and control groups across time that started out in generally the same place. That doesn't mean that just because we have a smattering of studies that do that, that I'm not going to look at the RCTs differently. Because just because we show baseline equivalents statistically across a range of demographic and perhaps essential treatment characteristics, the idea behind random is that I am randomizing the two groups so that I get at the unmeasured things, the unmeasured confounders. So I have two groups that are hopefully uh, equivalent with respect to the things that we're not measuring, and especially with respect to um, selection into the study itself. Right? So I think those are, are, are really crucial things to think about. It doesn't mean, though, because I'm separating them, it doesn't mean that the other is not important. It is important. It can tell us more, and we may have longer-term follow-up, for instance, in the other group. And if we find kind of equivalent uh, effect sizes, we might consider moving those together, but in general, you want to look separately first. That's for another, that's for another session. Uh, uh, heterogeneity, blah, 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 blah. Um, I think we have all of seven minutes left, is that right? Are we supposed to end at quarter after? Yeah, okay. Uh, we were going to do a group exercise, um, but we've kind of done the questioning thing, which is good. Uh, but we do have another cartoon. Uh, so uh, yes, yes, exercise, 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 exercise for health. Exercise is the key. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now seriously, what can we do? Um, I just thought it was cute. Uh, what was brought up today, uh, Howard brought up, uh, didn't quite call it a logic model, but a logic model might be a good idea. So it's not enough to just say, hey, is this intervention effective? We want to kind of know what is driving the intervention. Really, how, how do we see this change from intervention to outcomes unfolding over time? So it describes a connection uh, and it uh, can be a really simple logic model as in the one here uh, or it can be quite complex. I don't know if you guys have seen logic models that look like a structural equation model and you can't know, you don't know which one's up, but uh, it's really important to look at um, kind of how this thing unfolds and that helps determine what kinds of questions you're going to be asking and later for data extraction from the studies what you might want to be pulling from them. So a good logic model is a really important tool uh, in your toolbox for actually designing uh, the protocols and systematic reviews. Uh, the question about this logical model, sometimes uh, maybe this logical model is just based on assumption. Sure. So, so you, you, you're actually using assumption to as basis for systematic review or actually should be the, on the opposite? Uh, that the systematic review should test assumptions yeah. rather than the other way around. Well, you may be right. I, you know, I think we'd need to ground that in some sort of example. But I, I guess I'd turn that around and also say, well, you, m you might have an intervention. Uh, you might have this logic model, but you might also have kind of a process piece that maybe is more qualitative that tests some of those assumptions also. Um, and uh, a lot, uh, we can do a lot more with more studies that are done in the same way. So we can do moderator analysis and we can start testing some of these things. Uh, but, you know, when you end up with three or four studies 
the likelihood that you're going to be able to do that is pretty slim. So um, I think it's a good point. And um, another point that I didn't bring up that probably bears mentioning is in systematic reviews, oftentimes they're done by researchers that may or may not be across the area in terms of content. And it's really important to have a content person on board uh, as unbiased one as possible to kind of get at some of those, um, perhaps some of those assumptions, uh, to drive some of the, uh, the uh, questions that are lingering in the field about these certain interventions or these certain problems. Um, the, the temptation is to just say, hey, you know, I can do this. Uh, be careful because it becomes increased, it becomes more complex than you'd ever imagine when you get into these things. And uh, it's important to have content people, clients if possible, at least get a bead on where clients are at. And, you know, for assumptions, you know, I, I don't know, I, it'd be nice to be able to test them. And if you can really figure out what those assumptions might be, it could be that you could, you could extract data from the studies or do, uh, you know, kind of a nested qualitative look at these things uh, and try to weave that into uh, the review. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so you can build, again, you can build, the, I think what you're saying, you can build these logic models um, in more complex ways that get at these, at least you're listing what your assumptions might, you could list what your assumptions might be, and then you might find a way to get at testing them through the review process. So, uh, logic models are great. I mean, they really, they really help a lot, I think. It helps with feasibility, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It helps, it, it helps on a number of different levels, but I just wanted to throw that up there because that's really what was being talked about today. It wasn't necessarily explicitly saying it was a logic model. But, um, so, uh, of course, I'm going to end on a cartoon. And uh, there are no ra right answers except when there are. And uh, this teacher's in front of a class, and this is for Eileen. Uh, I expect you all to be independent, innovative, critical thinkers who will do exactly what I say. <laughs> Actually, don't do what I say, exactly. <coughs> but take some of this, the point is take some of this and apply it to your content areas, right? So what reviews you're interested, the reviews you're interested in need to be really carefully thought through in terms of what is, how are you formulating this thing? Who is it, who are you interested in? what problem, what interventions, what comparisons, what outcomes, and at the end of the day, what study designs, and knowing that each one of those decisions either widens or narrows the scope. And at the end of the day, you're going to come out with product, and that product won't do everything you want it to do, and it may or may not be the final word for, uh, you know, even one outcome, let alone the range of outcomes. Uh, but that's the process, you know, we'll, you know, if we start here where we know nothing and here's knowing everything, you know, let's move the needle a little bit and continue to be critical about what we do to what effect. Yes, this is so much better than a haphazard review, right, you know, one where we just pick literature and report on it, but it doesn't it's not going to answer all of our questions. In fact, it's going to raise new ones, and that's the beauty of life, and that's the beauty of research. It's going to continue on, and I hope you guys ask questions and systematically go about approximating your best answer to those questions. So thank you, and hope you enjoy the rest of the colloquium.